Thank you for coming. Uh, this talk is uh, Practical Mobile Application Attacks by Example. So I am the CEO of 7 Security. Uh, if you're interested in this talk, there's a lot of uh, public reports on the website. Uh, I was a, a team lead and a pen tester for Q53 and version one. So you can click on those uh, if you want to read more about those companies. Um, and I wrote a course for inner security about uh, practical web defense, about hacking and defending web applications. I'm the OWASP OWTF project leader, which is, which is uh, one of the OWASP flagship projects. Uh, there's some presentations here, and I also have some certification. So uh, yeah, if you're interested in this talk, uh, these are some public pentest reports from where you can learn a lot, especially these uh, two here. These were about uh, an application that was mandated in an entire country uh, of South Korea. So pretty much everything you should not do in a mobile app is here. There's like a lot of mistakes. And these are more kind of privacy related, what kind of uh, data is the application collecting and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, and these are other pen test reports on the website. Uh, if you are interested about this, you can learn more about those in there. So we're going to go through a lot of uh, practical mobile app attacks. And there's a game, what is the vulnerability? So I suggest, since this is recorded, I suggest you pause the video and then try to guess what the vulnerability is and then uh, jump to the solution, right? I will have to skip through that because this is not interactive. So let's start with sexy denial of service attacks. So uh, what does this command do? I'll pause and try to guess. So this is basically a denial of service, right? So we have a Netcat clone, SVD, and it's listening on port 80. And every time you close it, it's going to spawn again. So this is the delay of zero seconds to start again. And then whatever connects to this port 80, it's going to reply with the output of the yes command, which as it names uh, implies, it's always saying yes, 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 yes. So it's going to send a lot of data. And then we can crash the application and we will get a nice crash like that, right? So this is what the crash looked like. Uh, so basically the application runs out of memory and crashes, right? So uh, yeah, and then I'm also going to skip the fixes. You have them on the, you have some uh, mitigation about fixes on the slides, but because I have so many slides, I will have to uh, skip through this, but it's all written here for you about how to mitigate this. now. Uh, on Android, the SD card uh, is kind of the wild west, right? Because many applications can read and write data there. It can be extracted without even unlocking the phone. So for example, uh, a regular thief can like steal your phone, extract the SD card without um, unlocking the phone first. And there's no encryption typically, right? So um, this all makes uh, the SD card uh, this perfect location for physical uh, attacks and attacks um, from other uh, applications on the phone, right? So in this case, this was a vulnerability that could get somebody killed because this was kind of an application uh, meant to help the people in a given country to report human rights violations. So we have an environment where potentially police and law enforcement are against the people, right? So if uh, you say if, uh, that you reported a human rights violation, inside of uh, the SD card, then police can take your phone, can extract the SD card, see that you are reporting these issues, see what you reported and then uh, get you killed or whatever uh, nasty stuff they do there, right? So uh, this is an example of uh, security vulnerability leading to problems in the physical world, right? So yeah, here we had also like first name, last name, uh, address, so lots of uh, sensitive stuff uh, for this, right? Now, another scenario is uh, in the SD card, right? So take a look at this, pause the video, try to uh, guess what the vulnerability is, right? And now I'm going to move on to the solution. So the problem here is that the application is reading text files from the SD card, and then it's loading this text saving it into a variable and then uh, this variable page data and then this page data variable is being concatenated into HTML here without any output encoding or uh, whatsoever, right? So this results in XSS, right? So uh, what can we do with that? 
uh, we can, for example, depending on how the application is built, uh, we can do uh, um, um, like just basically set up a request, an XML HTTP request that is going to retrieve files from the private data storage of the application. And for this purpose, the hack vector uh, website is really useful because you can have like a script and then you do like evolve for char code. And then uh, this will give you like uh, the script without any like quotes and all these symbols that could break in this case, uh, the concatenation, right? Because you want the script to work. And um, this is the eval uh, stream from char code is like a way where you don't have any quotes and things work more smoothly, right? So in practice, uh, when the XSS was being executed, uh, this is what the application showed in a dialog. Uh, and then uh, this is how you would fix these kind of things. Uh, and now let's look at uh, copy paste the text, right? So what attack is this? Now pause the video and try to guess by yourself. So the solution is that uh, using CSS only, we can uh, specify that some text of the web page uh, the user is going to view, uh, but they will not be able to select it, right? So this is what this select none says. So using uh, CSS, we are telling the browser that this text uh, cannot be selected, even though it's being displayed. And then uh, underneath uh, this text, we are showing another text which the user cannot see at all, uh, but they will select unwillingly, right? So, and this is the text that will have the actual payload. So for example, if you have a fake tutorial and the user is copy pasting all the stuff to follow some steps, then they can get, uh, they can get this, right? So uh, in this website is a mobile app. The way this looked was um, like, just select all this text and copy paste it, right? So you have like some site. And then when the user copies this in reality, they are pasting something else here, right? So when uh, you click OK, then you would crash the app because uh, the application was being, uh, we are basically overriding uh, one of the files uh, in the application. So we are, this was a password vault application. So basically we are destroying the vault with uh, the export of the log, right? So the user is trying to export the log of the app but it's really uh, destroying the vault where all the passwords are. So it's kind of a denial of service, but uh, we're using a file overwrite using a path traversal with a copy paste trickery. So yeah, this is another cool example. This is how you would mitigate this stuff. And then for spoofing attack, right? So uh, spoofing attacks, basically similar to the copy paste in that you show one URL, but the click goes to another URL, right? So we have, for example, uh, these special characters, right to left and left to right. So we can uh, use these special characters here and we send a link like this, right? And then the application is going to be helpful and say, oh, this is a domain, so I have to put a link for this. So the victim is going to see this, but when the victim clicks on this, they are really going to go to this URL, right? Because we use these characters, so it's really the reverse of what the user sees. So this is another way uh, for kind of phishing attacks and other stuff like that, that sometimes works, right? So you can use this against email applications or chat applications or what have you. So let's now take a look at URL, uh, URL scheme attacks, right? So custom URL handlers and that kind of stuff. So sometimes applications define a custom URL handler. So in the case of the Onion browser, there was a function to quit which was exposed using um, a URL handler, right? So uh, yeah, the vulnerability here was that um, you could uh, provide like an image, for example, and call this URL handler and tell the application to quit, right? So we can invoke functionality in the application, which is a browser in this case, uh, from a page that the browser is visiting, and we can, for example, just close the browser from the page, right? The entire browser, not just our own page. So this is uh, an interesting attack. Uh, yeah, and the reason is uh, is this, right? So this is what the code looks like. Okay, so this is how you would fix this kind of stuff. 
And now let's look at logic bugs, bugs right? So for my in the middle, uh, the context is a secure messenger app. So we have uh, a clear text, uh, how to achieve clear text uh, man in the middle for XMPP, right? So uh, chat applications use this protocol, uh, XMPP. So what you can do is when you try to man in the middle, you can define plain as the only authentication mechanism. And then because there's nothing else to fall back to, sometimes the application will say, okay, if that's the only way I can log in, I will try to log in that way. And then the credentials will be sent uh, base64 encoded and you can base64 decode them and get the user credentials that way, right? So that's another thing um, that you can do. And this is how you would uh, fix this. So now let's look at update text, right? So if you have an application and it's doing a, an update check, what's the problem with this? I'll pause the video and try to guess by yourself. The issue is, of course, the update is being checked over clear text ACTP. So we have here clear text ACTP and it's retrieving a JSON file. So we can modify the response. And instead of providing the URL from where to download the update, we can provide a URL that is really a phone URL, right? So because we're attacking mobile apps, when the user clicks on the update to get the update, instead of getting the update, they are ringing, for example, a premium number, right? So this is one of the attack vectors uh, useful against uh, mobile apps, right? And this is how you fix this. Now let's look at a uh, user dialogue for SSL warnings. So we have this scenario, right? The application catches when there's like the certificate is invalid and it's going to phone the user. And the user is going to get something like this, uh, accept a non-certificate, always once aboard. Uh, and then this is how, um, a user, the application registers uh, a broadcast receiver, right? So on the fly, and this is something important to know, right? Because if you run browser or stuff like that, uh, this will only look at the manifest, but sometimes the application is going to register attack surface like a, a receiver in the code itself. So you have to look at the code too, right? So here it is uh, registering the receiver then starts the activity and waits for a response. And then at the end of when it gets the response, it will unregister the receiver, right? But there's a moment in time where this re uh, receiver is going to be listening for intents, right? And this is the, what the processing of the intent looks like to answer this question, whether to trust the, um, uh, the SSL certificate or reject it, right? So it's getting the intent extra for the decision, the intent extra for the choice. And then if the user decides to say, for example, always, then it will store it will store this certificate to trust it forever. Right. So what is the vulnerability in this? I suggest you go back and think about it for a while, pause the video, uh, and now I'm going to jump to the solution. So <clears throat> this was a permanent mine in the middle from bypass uh, using this, right? So We can send this broadcast receiver uh, an intent that is sending basically the decision and the choice of trusting uh, this SSL certificate forever. And then if we can do that <clears throat> at, the right, at the right time when the user is being prompted, we can bypass that and get our certificate accepted forever, right? So this is how they would fix this. And now let's look at another man in the middle of XMPP. So another thing that you can do when you man in the middle XMPP, so this uh, protocol for chat applications like Java, uh, Facebook and Gmail also have like some chat stuff. Uh, so to man in the middle this protocol, one thing that you can do is to set up prosody and then by default, it will run with a self-signed certificate. So if you can get uh, the application to try to authenticate to your prosody server, that's, that means that the application is trusting uh, self-signed certificates. So this is a good test uh, to do in case you face a situation like that. Now let's look at clear text HTTP communication, right? So what's the vulnerability here? Pause the video and try to guess by yourself. So the application tries to get some XML from the server, right? So we have some site.com, some path file, and then the file 
is saved like so, right? So we have uh, to download file name, which is retrieved from the XML, and to download contents, right? So, and this is how the file is created. So basically, we can uh, modify this media file, right? Uh, actually, this media file was from a library that the application was using. This was not in the response, but by doing a little bit of research, I found that there was this uh, file name thing that we could do with the media file. So in here, we basically uh, provide the path to the preferences, right? Because this was about reporting human rights violations, some stuff like that as well. Uh, and in here, uh, we can specify the preferences XML file. Of course, since we control the file, we can also specify whatever hash we want, and then the download URL for the XML file, right? So in the end, we get the preferences completely overwritten to, with preferences of our choice as an attacker. And then this resulted in a permanent man in the middle because in this preferences file, uh, you could specify which server you're going to send the uh, human rights violations to, right? So a government, for example, could exploit this vulnerability and get all the population to report uh, the human rights violations to the government instead of to the um, NGO, right? So um, yeah, this is how the attack looked like. So in Logcat, uh, the messages you could see here, the file was deleted and then the file was copied over, right? So this is how it was trying to save it on the SD card, but with the path traversal, we can basically override the preferences of the application. This is how you fix that. Now let's look at more clear HTTP for iOS in this case. So this was an application that was retrieving a CSS file. And then <clears throat> this CSS file was being used or concatenated inside of the HTML of the page. Okay, so now pause the video, try to guess by yourself. And this is the problem, right? We can modify uh, the CSS file so that uh, when it is concatenated, it closes the style that it was where it was meant to be inside. So we can close this tag and we can use a script tag. And then we can basically get permanent XSS uh, on the application forever because the server is going always going to reply, reply that the file has not changed. Whereas in here, uh, we are getting uh, every time the user opens an article, or JavaScript is going to execute, right? So this is uh, how it looked like the exploitation in practice. For XSS, this is always a good approach that you have your own attacker C um, JavaScript because then you can just keep modifying this file and try and try from the mobile phone and see what happens. Um, but it's more comfortable because you don't need to insert the payload each time and stuff, right? So. This is basically getting the cookies, the location, document title, the inner HTML, so basically everything. And then we get a report back to the attacker, like this is the IP, the user agent, the cookies, the URL, and all the HTML of whatever the user was reading. So we can spy on user behavior uh, on the app and see what kind of news they like or whatever, right? So this was the issue. And another thing that we could do here is uh, data exfiltration, right? Because uh, when things were being saved um, as favorite articles, then they would run from file. So this is why we have this check here for the exploitation. Uh, and then we could uh, read all the sensitive files in a loop, for example, right? So you define like some sensitive files in, in, in an array, and then you look through that, and just make uh, XML HTTP request to get them. And then with an alert, we can see if we can read them or not on the app, right? So that is the end of the exploit. And this is how this looked like in practice, um, just reading the file, right? So this is the call history. And then of course, we can also get uh, application files. So as, as long as the application can read it, uh, we should be able to read, right? So this is how this looks. So we, can, we need to get the token in, on iOS, right? Because on iOS, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a token that separates uh, the storage of the app and stuff. So in this case, the, this token was inside of the location. So with JavaScript, we could get the token and then we could read the file. Uh, and this is how you would fix this. 
uh, now again I'm skipping all that because of time constraints. Um, and then um, another another one about data exfiltration. Uh, if we have uh, browsing functionality, right? So we have an exported activity. There's a browser. There's an intent filter. Uh, and here we have we have this, right? So um, it's basically checking uh, what the URL is being passed, right? In this uh, query intent extra. Uh, and then you need to figure out what the vulnerability is. So just pause the video here and try to guess by yourself. And the vulnerability is, of course, that the file URL, the file URL scheme is being accepted, right? So this is a dangerous URL because we can, for example, uh, as a malicious application, we can define this URL uh, on the SD card. So as a malicious application, we can write this file uh, on the SD card, and then we can send an intent to the app so that it navigates to this uh, file URL. And then uh, from the still HTML file in, on the SD card, we can uh, dump all the databases and sensitive files that the application has uh, and send them to an attacker, right? So this would be how this looked like at the time. Uh, yeah, and this is how we fix this. So now let's look at crypto attack, right? So this was a crypto messenger. Just pause the video and try to figure out uh, what the vulnerability is here. And now I'm going to jump to the solution, right? So we have an arbitrary file write on decryption. Uh, the application receives uh, encrypted files, right? So one user sends an encrypted file to another. And uh, you encrypt both the file itself as well as the file name, right? So the application decrypts this and then gets the original file name and creates a new file with the original file name that the user intended. So uh, with this, uh, we can, again, use a path traversal and provide like another path. So when the user decrypts this, we can overwrite uh, arbitrary files within um, the storage of the app or of the SD card, right? So uh, this is really bad. And now, uh, Pause the video again, try to guess what the, this vulnerability is. And this is the solution, right? So this is the vulnerability. We have a string concatenation, a message escape for JavaScript on the message variable. So we can, for example, send an email that is like closing because this is going to be rendered here, right? So we want to close the single quote, add a semicolon, and then we add our a payload here. And then we add something at the end so that JavaScript doesn't break, right? So just an A variable, so then it will close fine. And then with this here, we can get the passphrase we has just been defined on the variable above. We can send the passphrase to uh, an attacker, right? And then you can uh, verify this with some netcat listener, for example. And then you get a request like get my secret passphrase. So we can steal the passphrase of the user uh, open your email, that is how you fix this. And now let's look at a mandated application in South Korea. So this is uh, the application I hinted about at the beginning. Everybody in South Korea was forced to use this. Parent, children, it was meant for the parent to control the children. Um, you know, when you say whatever in politics that is about saving the children, uh, it's always uh, the stakes are high. So. This is what they were trying, but unfortunately, the application was really broken as these two reports show. So uh, the first time we tested the application, the application was not using any SSL at all, right? So uh, if, for example, there was a child using public Wi-Fi, some bad guy could like get the URL and all the requests and all the stuff going on, right? So, uh, so yeah, there was no SSL at the beginning. Then uh, on the second round, they switch to SSL. So we have this HTTPS here. So we were like, okay, has this been fixed? But then we found that this is how they validate certificates. So now pause the video and try to see what the problem is with this. So yeah, basically uh, we have SSL man in the middle without warnings because whenever the application receives some SSL error, is going to proceed. It doesn't matter what the error is, it's always going to proceed. 
And if the host name is wrong for the given SSL certificate, it's just going to return true. So whatever happens is going to go, right? It's basically ignoring the warnings. Now, it's a video I'm trying to figure out what this algorithm is and what the problem is here, what is the vulnerability. And I'm going to jump to the solution. Okay, so this, the algorithm, of course, is XOR because we have uh, the input becomes the output, and then the same output, if you use as input, you get the same output as it was the input before. So basically, you use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. And you can see that this key is being um, hard-coded in the app like this, with the bytes like this, right? So this is what they were using to encrypt the, well, encry uh, encrypt the phones, right? It's more kind of encoding because uh, the key was on the application itself, but it's really encryption, right? So XOR encryption. Um, and then we can use the same key to encrypt and decrypt, and this was the Python snippet. Um, and then basically we have like an obfuscated phone number with the uh, hard-coded key on the phone, Run this through XOR, and this gives you the phone number uh, for the user, right? And it had not some null bytes here, maybe to make it harder to find uh, if somebody was running strings on the APK or something. Uh, so now let's take a look at this, right? Pause the video and try to see what the vulnerability is. And I'm going to jump to the solution now. So here we have uh, another problem, right? So we have a base64 decode of some fixed parameter that is hard-coded somewhere, saved into a string, and then here we get the bytes of the string. So basically this is the AES key uh, that is hard-coded somewhere, right? So we have uh, the request, right? So first there's the phone obfuscation using XOR, and then in, with the request we have AES, right? With this second hard-coded key, and then we get this encrypted uh, request. Right, so basically a useless AES layer with a static key that can be retrieved from the application. So in summary uh, of the implementation of Star Sheriff, we have this disaster of this is the phone number, you XOR it with a key that is hard-coded in the application and is uh, sent in the request like this, right? So the request is then encrypted using AES with a second hard-coded encryption on the application that anybody can retrieve. So these two steps are useless. Then the request is sent, uh, but the SSL validation is completely ignored, as we saw, because it was like proceed for SSL person stuff. And then we get the response back, right? So in essence, uh, the whole thing was broken. And uh, this slide, we just put it together because it was just so funny. It was so broken. This is how you would go about fix that. So now let's look at uh, code execution, right? So this was a cool scenario. It was a CRM application with Google Authentication. So to log in, you get a pop-up, right? If the user is not logged in, the user logs in with Google, and then the pop-up closes and sends the data to the application. So we have a login web view that is browsable. And then we have uh, here how the token is being saved that comes from Google. So. Pause the video, try to figure out what the vulnerability is, and now I'll jump to the solution. So the solution is that we have SQL injection and code execution. Right? So we have this string concatenation here, uh, and you can see that uh, the value that comes from the token is being concatenated into the SQL query like this. So uh, we have a SQL injection. Right? But is this only SQL injection, or is it more? Right? Because in this case, um, the application had like extensions enabled as well. So it is not just that you can run any SQL that you want, but also that you can load a, any extension, right? So for example, you have a malicious application on the phone. For this, you can, for example, go to the just trust me uh, exposed module. It doesn't matter, it's just another application. And you just save like with some A's, uh, the test.so, some uh, mimicking like a binary there. Then you give permissions to all the apps. So any app can read this, even though it's on data data. And then the malicious application sends an intent exploiting the SQL injection. And it tells the application to load the extension 
from uh, this path, right? So this was a, a code execution with SQL injection um, in a mobile lab, which was pretty cool. Uh, but, uh, well, yeah, and then um, on block cat, right, when you were checking, uh, this is what it would look like, right? So it has about but elf magic. So this is telling you that the application was actually trying to run this uh, binary, right? Because it's checking if it has good or bad elf magic. So this means that it's trying to run it. You could also work, uh, exploit this in phones running Android less than six um, using a malicious application that uh, loads, uh, first saves the file at test.so um, in the downloads directory of the phone, right? And then makes a second request a little bit later uh, to exploit the SQL injection and get the, the binary to run, right? So this is how that exploit looked like. And this was pretty cool because you would do it from a browser. Like somebody clicks on that malicious website and then you get code execution in the phone with the privileges of the application, right? So this is, yeah, we get the same but with magic. Uh, so now let's look at API attacks, right? So retrieving files from the server, typical use for the API. So let's take a look at this and try to figure out the vulnerability. So the issue is <clears throat> that we have the string replace on dot dot slash. Right, so this looks uh, okay in practice to many developers, but in reality, it is not, right? And I'll show you why now. And then it's trying to read the file, right? So that is basically how that looked like. So you can do, you can provide a sequence like this, and yes, the dot dot slash is going to be removed, but then you will end up with another dot dot slash, right? Because this pattern, this second slash is not going to be removed. And when you remove this, you still have these two dots. So basically, you get a path traversal, right? So you can turn dot, 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 slash, slash into dot, dot, slash, right? So with this, we can uh, make the traversal work. That is how you would fix that. Now, uh, API leaks for Mark Sheriff. And this is what we call the bully API. So basically, um, the application would leak information based on the phone number. So let's pretend that there's a bad child in the class that uh, he hates all the other children. And uh, he can, like, for example, knowing the phone number, try to log in as the parent uh, in this application that has been mandated in South Korea to impersonate the parent and, for example, not, the, not let the child, uh, avoid the child from, prevent the child from using the phone and this kind of stuff, right? So via Bully, you need the Bully API to uh, help you, right? So the bad child knows the phone number of the target child. So it says, hey, I know the phone number of this child I want to mess with. And then the API tells you, okay, this is the parent phone number. So with this alone, you can already do some damage. You can call the parent and tell him stuff. But um, for a bad guy, this would give you the login, right? And then, of course, you can ask uh, SmartShade, come on, I need the password to, to, you know, to be able to log in as the parent and mess with the child. So yes, Mark Sheriff would give you the password too. You could uh, impersonate the, the friend, right? So this is how this looked like in practice. Um, yeah, and the passwords were four digits strong as well, so uh, quite weak. You could even like brute force it. And, and yeah, this was uh, another scenario with Smart Dream. Uh, there was a similar leak. This is uh, an either, right? So an insecure uh, direct object reference. Uh, it was saved on text to speech. So basically, when a message contained harmful words, um, they were saved on a server. But you could uh, retrieve all the messages from all the children uh, calling this API, right? So this was pretty bad as well. This is how you would fix that. And with this, uh, since we only have 34 minutes, this is finished. Now, if you're interested in these applications, these are part of our mobile course. So. Anybody that takes your mobile course can take it free. And if you have any questions, since this is um, recorded and we don't have interaction, or if you find some of the attacks interesting or you want to talk about whatever else you want, you can send me an email anytime you want. Uh, thank you for coming.